Welcome. This is the Free Market Roadshow, probably the largest annual series of public conferences on economics. Remarkable experts are discussing the challenges and providing libertarian solutions to today's problems. Organized by the Austrian Economic Center in cooperation with select th institutes, universities and think tanks, the Free Market Roadshow tours all over Europe. Today we pay a visit to Tusla. Hello everyone, my name is Admir Chavalic. I'm a director and founder of Association Multi in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's my great pleasure to announce that uh, Multi, as a part of free market movement and free market roadshow family, will uh, organize free market roadshow event in Tuzla this year. Uh, this is not the first time that we do this and we did it quite successfully years before. Regarding Multi, uh, Association Multi, founded in 2011, uh, it's a, a pioneer and biggest uh, classical liberal libertarian organization in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We organized huge events, we educated more than 10,000 uh, students in Bosnia and Herzegovina and we published lots of books, two, three or five uh, even uh, sometimes books a year. Uh, we do translations, our own research, uh, publishing and so on and we are quite active in a public sphere. Uh, we like to promote certain ideas that regard uh, to decentralization, free markets, uh, open borders and all other topics that relate to classical liberalism. Uh, having that said, I hope that you will join us and that I will see you on our event. Thank you very much, Admir, for uh, your kind in, uh, invitation to join us all today in Tusla. And uh, it's my pleasure to announce our first keynote speaker, John Fund. Uh, John Fund is National Affairs columnist uh, for and an air analyst of the Fox News Channel. He has lived in Europe and he has reported from Europe extensively. And he is currently working on a book entitled The Non-Euro Nations how some countries dodged a bullet. He previously served as a columnist and editorial board member for the Wall Street Journal. He is the author of several books, including Stealing Elections, How Water Fraud Threatens Our Democracy. It was published by Encounter Books in 2012. And The Dangers of Regulation Through Litigation with ATRA Press in 2008. He worked as a research analyst for the California legislature in, in Sacramento before beginning his journalism career as a reporter for the syndicated columns Rowland Evans and Robert Novak. Roll Call, the newspaper of Capitol Hill, called him the Tom Paine of modern congressional reform movement. He has won awards from the Institute of, uh, for Justice, the School Choice Alliance, and the Warren Bo uh, Brooks Award for Journalistic Excellence in the American Legislative Exchange Council. John Fund has been a speaker at the Free Market Roadshow from the very beginning, and we're very much looking forward to hearing his remarks now. John, the floor is yours. Hello. I'm John Fund with National Review Magazine and FoxNews.com. Well, what a year it has been for all of us. The pandemic is slowly receding. We still have to exercise great caution, but it's not too early to look back and try to figure out what lessons we can learn from that and also what warning signals there are for the future. Uh, we were told a year ago in March that the lockdowns and the other restrictions on our liberties were going to be of very temporary duration. 15 days to crunch the curve. Well, I have to say for many countries which haven't really come out of lockdown, it feels more like 15 months to crunch society. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. It is very important that once we recover from this pandemic, we don't transition into what I call a plandemic, which means we no longer have the freedoms, the entrepreneurial innovation, uh, the ability to create new and interesting things in our societies 
because regulation, restrictions, and a general increase in government spending and taxation will make all of that much more difficult. I'm not saying we go back to normal, but the new normal has to be something that preserves the essence of our free societies. Uh, the civil liberties, the entrepreneurship, uh, the dynamics of the free market, and the free trade and flow of goods that have brought us so much prosperity. There is a danger, though, that a different model will take hold. Now, the U.S. and other governments have spent lavishly to boost the economy during the pandemic, and many people have grown to like this idea. Like it so much, in fact, that history suggests that high levels of public expenditure will continue to be a norm for a long time to come. People come to benefit from it and then to expect it. That makes it harder to go back to a time of restraint and lower spending. Now let's look at the New Deal, a period of very intense public expenditure during the Great Depression that gave way to, of course, the even greater spending and even greater restrictions on liberties of World War II. U.S. outlays as a share of GDP went from 3% to 9% by the end of 1933, and then to nearly 10% by the end of the 1930s. The World War came in, everything exploded, and expenditure was 41% by 1944. It wasn't just that the government spent on infrastructure or welfare of the military. It was that the government imposed more regulation and taxes as well. The state grew bigger in nearly every possible way. And of course, it never permanently came back down. Just after 1945, the government stopped spending on fighting the war. So a sharp dip ensued but then, of course, spending began to climb again very quickly, as welfare state spending took the place of the military spending. By the time Ronald Reagan became president in the 1980s, net outlays were still about 20% of GDP in the U.S. Reagan just slowed the growth of big government, and his successors began to increase it gradually. So they were running deficits of around 4% or 5% a year. The largest peacetime spike until the pandemic came just after the 2008 recession, when federal net outlays in the U.S. touched 24%. As of now, after COVID-19, the figure has hit 36%, assuming that all the allocated money that's been authorized by Congress is spent. And President Joe Biden's proposed $4 trillion stimulus, did you ever think that number would just trip off our tongue, has not yet been factored in. That's a pretty substantial number. The GDP in 2019 was $21 trillion. So Biden's spending is close to 20% of our entire nation's gross national product on its own. Indeed, the government grew on the back of emergencies such as the Great Depression and the World Wars. The economist Robert Higgs has found in his famous book, Crisis and Leviathan. What Higgs said is that if we analyze the results of these emergencies, he quote, said, chief among them, the enduring legacies of emergency governmental expenditures has been ideological change. In particular, a profound transformation of the typical person's beliefs about the scope and size of government. I fear that we may be living through that again. It isn't just the public that comes to prize such expenditures. The political environment, the political opposition to these growth and government reduces to Pub Republican governments through the second half of the 20th century didn't always aim to be leaner. In no presidency, Republican or Democratic in the United States, since that of Dwight D. Eisenhower, has the U.S. seen a decline in federal outlays as a percentage of the GDP. And Eisenhower himself 
in the midst of expanding Social Security, building highways and constructing low-income housing, well, all of this we call infrastructure today, only brought spending down from 20.4% to 18.4%. The pandemic represents another crisis of the kind that Robert Higgs discussed in his book. So if his observation is any guide, the size of the state and its expenditure will not shrink in a hurry. It's easy for people to start thinking, yeah, I survived the pandemic only because of this money. It will open the door for more spending. That's what we have to guard against. Yes, there are lessons to be learned from the pandemic in public health and in the ability that we have to react to these emergencies, but we cannot forget the ultimate emergency is if the fundamental nature of the free market, the fundamental nature of our economy, and the fundamental nature of our civil liberties are negatively affected by how we react to this pandemic going forward. I believe in a free society, we have to have a robust debate about all of these questions. So far, we haven't had that, possibly for understandable reasons. But now is the time to begin that debate. And that is why the Hayek Institute and the Austrian Economic Center are so important in starting this discussion. I am pleased to be a part of this. I am always happy to speak on behalf of the Hayek Institute, which I believe represents the best and finest of classical liberal values. And with that, I welcome you to join and participate in this discussion with myself, the other speakers, and of course the staff of the Hayek Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure to have had you uh, uh, present the keynote. My name is Barbara Kolm and I'm the director of the Austrian Economic Center and the Hayek Institute. I now have the privilege of um, uh, sharing the panel with three gentlemen from Bosnia-Herzegovina who will discuss the limitation of individual and entrepreneurial freedom and what has happened during the COVID crisis. The first gentleman I may introduce is Farouk Hadzic. He is a PhD candidate in the field of economics theory and politics, a master of economic sciences in the field of international economics, and an expert in the field of macroeconomic management. He's engaged as a lecturer at the University of Sarajevo School of Science and Technology and a macroeconomic analyst uh, in the analysis of economic indicators. He provides expert opinions, comments, suggestions related to the economy of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, he also is the author of a significant number of uh, studies and scientific papers. He won one gold and two silver plaques of the University of Tuzla for success during his studies. Farouk, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Well, it was a real pleasure to, um, to hear opinion about the um, economic pandemics uh, all around the world. And maybe it is the best possible way uh, to quote former United States President Ronald Reagan, uh, and he said once about the consumption. I will just read it because uh, it's very, very um, important quote for this. We don't have a trillion dollar debt because we haven't taxed enough. We have a trillion dollar debt because we spent too much money. And uh, in a situation like this, of course, it is the, the um, normal mechanism, I would like to say like that, mechanism in the world that government use expenditures, higher expenditures to, to try to, to help um, the state, the citizens in, in times of crisis like this. Uh, well, um, in a uh, situation like this, the COVID pandemic was a different crisis. Um, maybe um, at the beginning, it was thought it would be uh, similar in depth with uh, Great Depression and we, we uh, experienced sharp decline in economic activity uh, all over the world, um, in our country as well. 
um, but uh, the, the causes of this pandemic crisis were a bit different and uh, it affected also supply and demand side of one economy. That's why it was curious to try to use same mechanism as before because it was a different crisis in, in uh, basics. And uh, what, we, what we can um, see right now, uh, maybe the first uh, wave of this pandemic in economic way, of course, was that, but uh, probably because of the high spending, uh, high money printing through monetary policy, uh, maybe we should experience in a next period higher inflation rate, which is um, already um, it is already uh, mentioned in economic circles. So, uh, what we what we uh, what we experienced in our degree that uh, this pandemic may be a pandemic, and there is there is a plan to there is a plan to limit uh, freedom of citizens uh, all all around the world and uh, in our country you could hear the sentence next 15 days are crucial and now we can i, I would totally agree that next 15 months are crucial our limit uh, our freedom uh, was uh, limited in several cases we'll probably discuss uh, later today in um, in this uh, panel with colleagues uh, Chavalic and uh, Hajovic because we also experienced some negative um, negative um, negative um, from in our public in our public visa we have experienced some negative consequences of our uh, opinions and um, that's why we should uh, take more care in future when planning uh, when planning uh, economic uh, responses to the crisis. Uh, thank you very much, Farouk, um, especially for providing the term uh, pandemic. Um, it's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Daniel Hatzdovich. He's um, He studied acquired a formal education at the Faculty of Political Science in Sarajevo, but he has a far greater education, although informal, acquiring by reading books and developing skills of his own choosing. Uh, he's a journalist and his first journalistic assignment was with Radio 202 in 2009. He then worked at Depo Portal uh, Federation TV and the uh, Slobodna, sorry, we, Bosna Weekly. He is currently uh, the editor of the Navy Avas, the highest circulation newspaper and the most widely read internet media in Bosnia Herzegovina. He authored, of course, several hundreds uh, of articles, comments, columns, analysis, and an investigative stories and interviews that were published in Bosnia-Herzegovina and, of course, uh, in the regional me media outlets. In 2015, with several like-minded individuals, he established the Liberal Forum and an association dedicated to the promotion of spreading the policies and values of an open and free society. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barbara. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, when it comes to today's topic, there is no doubt, doubt, as Sean said, that COVID once again has given free power to governments to arbitrarily deprive citizens of, uh, citizens of their liberties in the name of their own good and their own health, and also economic prosperity and the citizens, which is, I think, even the worst problem here, themselves have agreed. Uh, to uh, give the enormous powers to the governments to take care of them and their health and their security. But in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have an even bigger problem than that, I think. Uh, here, the government also applied autocratic measures like the most European uh, countries, and they were following their example. But uh, something worse, I think, happened here, and I think the world should know about that and especially our neighbors in Europe. Uh, here the government is dealing with problems 
uh, the pandemic has shown that the government in Bosnia is so incompetent, so bad, uh, that it is unable to fulfill even its basic functions. Uh, so on the one hand, you in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you have a very big government who are taxing about half of income of every worker, a worker in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have a very large public sector in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but uh, when you have something like this, like the, the pandemic crisis, and when you are expecting from the government to take care of the security of its citizens because the government has took uh, that uh, task uh, for itself, uh, you have a complete catastrophe. As an example, I will mention that the Bosnian authorities uh, have not been able to buy vaccines to this day. So uh, we are the only European country who didn't buy any vac vaccines. And in the end, our neighboring state, our neighboring country, Serbia, decided that people uh, that would vaccinate our citizens. So uh, Serbia is vac vaccinating the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina because uh, the Bosnian government uh, didn't know how to get the vaccines. Only in Europe. Uh, the healthcare system collapsed in Bosnia and Herzegovina during the pandemic. Uh, so we are the first country in Europe in terms of mortality from COVID-19. Uh, during the attempt to buy ventilators for COVID patients, uh, a large criminal case occurred when the government of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, tried to use uh, the COVID crisis to uh, rob citizens tax money uh, through that procurement and because of, of that case a criminal trial is currently being conducted against the Prime Minister of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina for other knowledge. So you have a unique example that a Prime Minister uh, who should take care of the uh, vaccines and who should take care of the country during the crisis must also go to the courts and he is facing a very uh, a very much amount of years in prison. Uh, because of all of this, we got a new form, also of repression that has not been seen as such anywhere in Europe. I think that politicians of the ruling parties, both directly and through their votes, in recent months, they began to threaten and make all sorts of pressures to our journalists, intellectuals, and individuals, influential individu individuals who, who, who expose crime, and their incompetence during pandemic. So the situation during the pandemic in Bosnia is, I think, much worse than in the rest of the world, and especially Europe, uh, when we see the mortality rate and uh, when we see how the government is in Bosnia and Herzegovina is dealing uh, with the pandemic. Uh, the government, on the, on the one hand, has shown a complete inability for, to fulfill uh, the basic tasks of protecting the security of its citizens, and we pay our tax money for that. And on the other hand, uh, they are trying to hide their inability by attacking and threatening journalists, intellectuals, and the political opposition. Uh, so during the pandemic in Bosnia, I think the masks have fallen. We now know that we have a government that is unable to fulfill its basic tasks and uh, we pay them uh, a lot of low taxes, so the real question is, I think, in this pandemic, is Bosnia and Herzegovina really functioning as a state? Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, our last speaker of today is Admir Kavalic, and he's the founder and director of MULTI, the pioneer and biggest libertarian association in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We've been working with MULTI for many, many years on the free market roadshow there. Um, inspired by the works of Milton Friedman, Admir produced a documentary called uh, Economy, which was the first Bosnian docu documentary expressing liberal economic solutions. Admin is also a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Tuzla on the subjects of management and entrepreneurship.
He has written numerous scientific papers on the topics of economic freedoms, social responsibility, creative industries, marketing and communications and the like. And I think he will also announce something today later. Uh, he is also the co-author of a book, Islam and the Free Market, and editor of the Bosnian editions of Economics of Freedom and the Essential Hayek. Admir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barbara. It's a great pleasure to have a second free market roadshow in Tuzla for this year. Hope next year as a free market uh, roadshow family, we will organize this uh, in live in person uh, because the, the situation with COVID-19, I hope, is getting uh, better. Uh, regarding uh, this subject, as uh, Mr. John stated uh, earlier and earlier speakers, uh, we are witnessing a huge uh, change, uh, paradigm shift uh, re regarding the uh, role or perceived role of the government in our uh, society. Uh, uh, we are actually witnessing the move movement of overthrown uh, window uh, regarding the government intervention in the form of lockdowns and generally uh, the role of the government when it comes to uh, supporting businesses, closing them at one one side and giving them mat material and any other financial assistance at the other side. Uh, I'm worried as a liberal uh, because of the more government intervention, especially in a, in a field of economics, because history shows that if you have more government intervention, eventually you will have to pay the price of that. At first, it looks great, everyone is applauding, even opposition is supporting certain illiberal issues, but eventually uh, we need to pay those bills, uh, especially when it comes to, to economical uh, freedoms. Uh, it will be interesting for all those authors who are doing the research regarding economical freedoms and civil freedoms, uh, uh, in a sense, w what was the last year like? Uh, I'm looking forward for all the reports that will, uh, I hope, uh, show, demonstrate, analyze uh, the, the fall of economical uh, freedom, unfortunately, around the world, because governments introduce lockdowns. Uh, lockdowns are special uh, problems that we as liberals didn't discuss before. We're not aware of their potential and they're imported from the Asian countries. We know uh, which country. Uh, uh, and we. Uh, this is the first time that uh, we are actually introduced to them in the real world. So the biggest challenge that we were going to have is uh, how to fight uh, lockdowns on the uh, long term and how to prevent uh, governments from introducing lockdowns in the future. Regarding the, uh, not just because of the future pandemics uh, and so on, but also because of the different uh, situations. Uh, also, I need to state this, like uh, if, if someone followed the, the liberal authors from the beginning of pandemic, the models of Sweden and other countries that, that use those models and all those people and organizations that were alarming against uh, lockdowns and other illiberal measures. Uh, you can see right now, especially from the last month, but this month also, that uh, lots of things that were written said uh, people were right. Uh, Fauci ma mails, uh, the scandal regarding them and all the other things that are coming to sur surface in public space right now uh, show that government didn't act normally, didn't act uh, scientifically, which was their higher ground, and uh, it really demonstrated a pure force uh, against their citizens and companies. So I think uh, we, will, we need to use this year to, to actually counter-argument the lockdown position and all those people who were supporting uh, the same. They are the new interventionists, the new socialists, the new communists of our century, uh, the people that are uh, fetishizing the, the role of government and uh, stating that we need 
to have scientific evidence and we need to have scientific based measures that will solve all our problems like like a, a fairy tale like a rainbow and, and so on regarding bosnia and herzegovina uh, i hope i will have time to uh, to uh, speak more about uh, the, the case uh, of this country uh, that we all come from as speakers uh, but uh, i would like to point to certain issues right now characteristics uh, first of all it's highly decentralized country which is really interesting for all the future research regarding the covid 19 uh, answer of the government because uh, in, in matter where you live in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina he, uh, your uh, civil liberties and economic freedoms were uh, less or more tacked as, as such uh, we had less strict measures even today if you look on global maps of uh, travel restrictions you will see that bosnia albania kosovo montenegro are really uh, travel free so it's really easy to come here and yes if you compare our statistics it's really similar and uh, not so much different compared to other countries that had lockdown except one thing which daniel hajovic mentioned and that's mortality uh, rate the number of people who died from COVID-19 uh, but that uh, actually opened and un uncovered a uh, different problem and that's regarding the poor public service public sector in Bosnia and Herzegovina lots of money is spent in healthcare but generally the healthcare has its own political economical and other structural issues that we could not reform so essentially we have bad bad uh, health care and people uh, don't have alternative as such so uh, lots lots of things that we can learn from from that case uh, study uh, this is my take for now and and happy to answer all the, the future questions uh, thank you very much, uh, Admir. These were pretty straightforward uh, interventions by all the three of you. And I already have a long list of questions, but I let me announce, of course, that uh, this event is live streamed and you can also watch it on YouTube and also on our Free Market Rocha channel. But feel free to send us questions and to post those questions um, at freemarket-rs.com slash event slash second minus free market at Roto FMRS minus Tusla. So the, um, the first questions that I have are more generally, and I take the liberty of, of asking them. And the first is for Farouk. And the question is, is freedom of expression restricted in some way in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Do you have any experiences of your own that you can share with us? Yes, thank you very much. Uh... In general, in Bosnia, you have your own freedom to, to express your opinion. You are, for example, free market economy, uh, there is capitalism here, everything on paper, but the, the reality is a bit different. Um, the reality is a bit different here in Bosnia. For example, uh, I would I would describe our uh, country as captured state. It is more closely to captured state than to to uh, free country, free modern country, and it is captured by the um, some interest groups that are called here political parties. When they uh, won election, we, we have free winners here, and uh, winners take all in Bosnia, and those winners are not just con just controlling the parliaments they are controlling all resources in our country they are controlling state-owned enterprises this this is uh, the main focus of their interest to control uh, public resources they will use for political purpose not for state purpose or, so or purpose in, in, in or other citizens. words if i may in other words if i may interrupt you taxpayers money government uh, money of the citizens is used just to to use to reduce their individual freedom and to force them into something that was not their choice yes of course because uh you have full control of public procurement uh, process here in bosnia and it is controlled by the 
uh, political parties. They control where the money uh, should go from uh, our taxpayers' money, where, where it, it will go. And the, the, uh, when, you, when you express your own opinion about something, Daniel will probably say more about this as journalist, but uh, I will give you one curious case. Uh, I never um, talked about this in public. Um, and the case is about oh, well, one letter that one group of economists, uh, a col colleague Chavalich was also part of that group. We wrote a letter in December last year uh, to IMF here, Office of IMF here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, there were some negotiations between uh, IMF and our country about the new loan our country should take to, to finance something. And uh, we wrote a letter to IMF asking not to give that money for our country because we knew that money uh, would be used just to spend on public administration without any clear purpose. And um, the case was like this. Five, four or five days after that letter, I received a call from um, one of tax authorities here in Bosnia um, to um, go to their office and I asked them, okay, no problem, what is the problem here? And they said, we don't know, or we just uh, received an um, order to, to, um, to check all your transactions, financial transactions last six years and uh, after that process was over uh, i got minutes uh, from uh, this tax uh, office administration and everything was clear there was no uh, single uh, penalty about any undeclared income from my side but it was the message from the government you, you were writing a letter to the imf asking them not with your colleagues of course not to uh, receive, uh, to, to get this loan from IMF, because we said, okay, maybe, maybe we should uh, take a higher loan, but we need to know the purpose of that money, where, where that money will go, what, what we will uh, spend with that. And that was the main case about this. I, I see. And um, let, me, let me follow up on that with, with Daniel. Um, I think... Uh, journalists were attacked because they criticized government. Could you confirm that you, you kind of maneuvered through that uh, in a not so clear way, but could you tell us something about that, if that is true, if you criticize government, if you, are, uh, if you have issues then as a journalist, not as an individual citizen, as, as Farouk just mentioned? Yeah, yeah, the government in Bosnia Herzegovina, the government officials are targeting journalists, not only journalists, public intellectuals, and all the influential public persons who are criticizing uh, the role of the government during the pandemic. And they have, they are, I think, a little bit feared because uh, there were a few uh, cases of corruption uh, during the pandemic that uh, the media has detected and reported about it, and because of that, the Prime Minister of Federation uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina has a criminal case against him now uh, for uh, using taxpayers' money uh, to give it to himself and their, uh, their, their partners uh, from the government. So the reaction uh, from the government officials, from the leading parties, is that they are openly threat, uh, threatening uh, media, journalists, uh, intellectuals, and uh, uh, they, they have their, uh, what would I call them? Let me, uh, let me jump in. Who they are, who they are, are, are yeah, okay. No, go, go ahead, sorry. We were just interrupted briefly. So they have their bots, I think. Uh, they have their machinery. And they are using those people to threaten journalists, to threaten media, and they to try uh, to silence you if you are doing anything or saying anything against the government. You also have cases uh, that people who are comforting and criticize uh, the, uh, the government measures or the behaving of the government are losing their jobs in public, but even uh, in the private. 
uh, sector. So uh, the repression in Bosnia and Herzegovina has increased, and I think our government uh, lost its mind because they were using the situation uh, about the pandemic to, on the one hand, uh, make some uh, corruptive businesses, and on the other hand, uh, they have lost their compass, and they are now making a huge pressure uh, on journalists and all the people who are uh, criticizing the government and who are uh, uh, making the case uh, against their uh, co co corruptive scandals and other things. So it's uh, a very bad year. Uh, the last two years are very bad years for democracy in Bosnia and Herzegovina and for the individual uh, freedom and for, for the first time uh, after the fall of communism in Bosnia and Herzegovina you have a situation now that uh, the government officials are directly threatening and from, 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 uh, 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 are directly uh, threatening and uh, making pressures uh, towards all the individuals uh, public intellectual journalists and etc who are criticizing their work so I think uh, uh yeah, go Thank you. Th let, let, let me interrupt you here, Daniel, because I want to follow up with, with Admir on, on what he mentioned kind of in between the lines that, you know, these were kind of human rights violations on the one hand and on the other hand, um, the interventions by government were not on the safe and solid scientific um, uh, basis. Is, is that true? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I have so many cases. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, Miss Aldina Jahic and, and uh, Marisa Hasic, and uh, me, we wrote uh, one paper, like scientific paper, uh, regarding the human rights uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it will be published in Visio uh, Institute. Uh, uh, I, I think this uh, this month, and we, there we actually uh, demonstrated all the uh, cases of of human rights violations. So, regarding the non scientific approach of the government, let me just state uh, the example of curfew. Uh, so, it's really a funny example because half of the country entity of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina had curfew, and the other half, uh, Republic of Serbia didn't have curfew uh, for a period of almost six months so even in this uh, year as such and uh, when when we investigated uh, the reasons be behind the curfew so it was uh, 11 11 uh, p.m. sometimes even 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. you couldn't go outside uh, drive your car, uh, company's uh, car or so on, if you didn't have some kind of permit. So uh, the main reason be behind that was not the COVID-19 pandemic, because nowhere in the world you have scientific reasons uh, that demonstrate certain causality be between the police curfew and the less uh, infected or less dead people from COVID-19, the main reason was that they had less car accidents. And that was really true, if you look at the statistics. So uh, we openly asked the question, okay, why shouldn't you just ban driving? And in that case, we would have zero car accidents because no one will drive cars. And that's the main problem. That's why I'm saying like we're really entering danger zone. And so I you, you think that people will be nudged in and they, they will not be allowed to take their own choices and be uh, live their life of their own? Yes, because it's really problematic. Uh, lots of people didn't argue against curfew. And lots of people, especially old people like communist uh, type uh, persons that lived in former Yugoslavia, they were just fine with that uh, measure. Although that measure doesn't have, I would say, even uh, no correlation between that measure and, and uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, less people died from car accidents, and that's true. Uh, gentlemen, I have a whole bunch of questions here and let me ask you to answer much shorter because I want uh, the debate to be more lively. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, despite the fact that everything you say is very important to us. And um, I have one thing that, that stuck to my mind when you mentioned that the government did not even order vaccines. If you go across the border to Serbia, uh, Serbians invited people from across Europe to go there and they could even choose which vaccine they wanted to uh, have the shot with. So and they even marketed it and then made some kind of tourism out of it. So what is your take on that? Why was your government, yes, Admir, <laughs> limiting it, entrepreneurial and individual freedoms that much and didn't take action? Admir and then uh, no, the, please. Uh, just one thing, I think the decentralized model of Bosnia and Herzegovina failed regarding the buying of vaccines and so on. Serbia is really a champion. Uh, it is a public shame that, for instance, you have students of medicine from Tuzla, Tuzla Canton, that are going to Serbia to get their vaccines. But there is only, uh, I, I need to share with the audience one uh, interesting thing regarding Serbia. And I wrote an article before, a couple of months before, when Serbia was uh, even among in Europe. Uh, when you look at the research uh, regarding the public stance uh, regarding the uh, vaccines, meaning the anti-vaccine -vac movement, uh, in Balkans, the Serbia is number one. So I personally think, although Serbia is a champion, that Serbia is hitting the wall of anti-vaccine movement in their country. So that's why Serbia is inviting uh, people from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you can see that in last week's statistics. So Serbia is starting to fail behind, not because they don't have vaccines, but because people, they have the strongest anti-vaccine movement in, in former Yugoslavia countries, which is uh, like interesting fact. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying uh, something bad regarding the government of Serbia, but, but uh, the, their, their perceived people and so on. Daniel, you wanted to add something. Well, I just want to tell that I think this is the biggest win of Serbia in the last, I think, 30 years because Serbian vaccination is the champion in Europe, uh, maybe only behind uh, Great Britain. And uh, on the other hand, you have a completely collapse of the Bosnian government who is showing that they are not capable of doing anything. So I think that's a big political win for Alexander Vucic, the president of Serbia, and for the Serbian political position because Serbia is now showing to us, okay, we are not only uh, vaccinating our own citizens and we are not among two first countries in Europe uh, with uh, vaccination, but we are also open our gates for Bosnia and for other Balkan countries uh, who, who can come here to us and get the vaccine. So I think uh, that was a very, very good move and uh, Serbia is now using this situation and other similar situation to establish itself as the leading power in the Balkans. Thank you. Before I ask um, uh, Farouk, with regards to bureaucracy and, and economic freedom limitation, I would go back to the point that uh, Admir, uh, that, may, that was made by Admir with regards to the lockdowns that we have not uh, discussed before. And there is a question from the floor um, to Admir uh, that says, instead of lockdowns, would it have been preferable for Western countries to introduce contact tracing, etc., as some Asian countries did at the beginning? What is your take on that, Admir? Yeah, I think the lockdowns are the e easiest solution. Also, you have so many unanswered questions regarding lockdowns. Lots of public figures that were promoting lockdowns. If you look at their CVs, you would see that they have certain connections with China, which is alarming, and we need to investigate that. Uh, so uh, lockdowns are uh, politically easiest we, uh, solution. We don't have scientific data regarding lockdowns. They were taken for granted. I think it would be much smarter, clever politically, economically, that we uh, use uh, some other, we call it smart uh, solutions. Even Faruk and I and Kolega Damir Bacirovic wrote reports regarding that. So, for instance, uh, Chicago University did a great research showing that if you uh, implement lockdowns, lots of people will stay at home and mingle with the family and get the vir virus uh, uh, transmitted. But the biggest uh, problem the, uh, is how to keep people safe at their workplace. 
and there we need to have certain me measures improving industrial protection and so on uh, uh, but also lockdowns don't give the results we like to joke in bosnia like germany has the strictest strictest lockdowns in europe and discipline among the population but uh, no matter what the the virus is transmitting it's moving uh, sometimes even in, in bigger cases than in bosnia so you know, that didn't have lockdowns it only had partial lockdown Okay, um, before we go into details, I would also ask uh, Farouk to answer the question, to what extent does bureaucracy, which limits economic freedom, affect the economic development of Bosnia-Herzegovina? You touched um, uh, upon it, or one of you touched upon it in the talk with uh, regards to economic freedom, indices, etc. But what, a, what about uh, bureaucracy? Uh, yes, I will try to, sh to answer that shortly uh because we have a lot of questions uh it may be uh, strange and, and it could sound strange but we need to intervene here in bosnia uh to to have more freedom uh why uh let me try to to explain you with one uh example if you would like to uh, establish company here in bosnia you would probably need 80 80 days uh, you need to fulfill around 13 procedures and when you when you propose uh, to to try to um, establish company faster here in bosnia to try to uh, apply uh, through internet uh, with new digital technologies uh, you would get answer from administration it is the separate cast here in bosnia it is not possible uh, there are a lot of barriers etc why because they don't want to uh, change anything here they they have um salary uh, that will come every month of course with our uh, tax taxpayers money and that's why we are currently on 184th position in the world in establishing company according to the world bank doing business so uh, if you would like to uh, improve situation here in boston you need to intervene to um to free companies to free market to free administration to free state from uh, those chains uh, of interest groups that i already mentioned before and political influence in that case you would have more freedom and more prosperous country with a lot of individual freedoms that can be fulfilled here. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, one very specific question here for Daniel uh, from Scott. And he asks, to what extent would intellectuals actually be critical of the government's failure? In other gov countries, government COVID policies, good or bad, have been supported by the chattering classes. So what is your take as a journalist and what your colleagues would say? I think the intellectuals were very critical of the government uh, measures and uh, primarily because of their incapability to deal uh, with the pandemic crisis. They didn't know how to get the vaccines. The uh, health sector in this country is in awful shape. Uh, they had a problem which give the uh, service and treatment for all the COVID patients in our country. So the uh, intellectuals, but maybe even more, uh, journalists uh, have been very critical of the government uh, measurements and uh, governments deal uh, with, the, with the pandemic. And in that case, we have a little bit a different situation than in the rest of Europe, because I think the bigger problem uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina were not only the measurements, but uh, it was the complete inefficiency of the government in uh, dealing with the pandemic and uh, uh, they, 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 their uh, uh, bad results in dealing with the pandemic were much worse uh, than uh, the measurements that they have taken. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I have a couple of questions now that are more general, and I would ask um, all the three of you to briefly answer them in order to get our dis to continue our, uh, conversation. Um, uh, Kai wrote regarding pandemics. Do you think governments will be more often uh, or try to lock down public life in the future? 
uh, he uses the example um, to for climate lockdowns to to fight global warming. Uh, what can we do against that? So, what is your take? Just uh, all the three of you, just give me brief answers. Thanks, Admir. Why uh, don't you ask uh, uh, start? Okay, thank you, Barbara. Yeah, uh, I think yes because we tried this model, and unless we are more That's loud, right. more That's more critical. Right. And uh, generally, uh, unless we write more, argue more against lockdown, I think we will have that destiny in front of us uh, for the future governments. Because it was tried now, uh, there wasn't a strong opposition against it. And uh, I think that's, that's a problem for the future. It's a great question to ask, like regarding climate changes and so on. Protect our individual freedoms and our entrepreneurial freedoms. We need to step up and, and fight those uh, those things. Um, uh, as a journalist, what, what would you do, uh, Daniel? I think the government has now increased its force or we have to be, I think, more critical, more loud. We have to be more organized, the freedom movement in all the world uh, to give alternative uh, politics and solutions to our, our problems. But uh, I think the government has now uh, a very uh, good condition to increase its power and to use uh, in future cases, uh, in future crises, to tell us, OK, we need more power and we need a more open hands to deal with that problem. So it will be a very, very tough fight. And, we, we, must, we have to be loved and we have to strengthen uh, the liberty movement. But as we know from Hayek, how uh, knowledge is created in society, it's done by the individual. So the individual matters, and so we need to start with those. Uh, and coming to this thing, uh, from an academic perspective, and Farouk, this question goes to you, what, how would you support actually the next generation? Because somebody will have to pay the price for all the money that is going, that is injected into the system, for all the money that was wasted. Somebody has to pay for it. So how would you teach your students uh, and how would you educate them in order to be aware of the issues and, and, and problems? Uh, I already mentioned the IMF letter that we wrote in December. We said it's not um, it's not problem how much uh, we are taking from you. It is uh, more important where we should spend that kind of money. So if we are, for example, using that to finance public sector, it is a very stupid uh, loan. Uh, I think my colleague Admir said that several times. I totally agree with that. It's a very stupid way to, to finance uh, public administration. But if you are using the loan to, to finance something that will uh, bring you a new value in future, it is uh, in that case something that is more productive but there is also who will pay the price in future because as you know probably a lot of people are emigrating from bosnia and herzegovina and uh, when we are losing population uh, so the debt is staying here it is not also moving abroad and uh, the, the population that lives currently here in bosnia will repay that debt probably in future and if we don't have enough cash to finance everything, to finance that loan, then we should spend our uh, state-owned companies. It's a se totally separate uh, topic. We don't have time, but uh, all of us should have a um, complete consensus about that, about that issue. So the question is who, who will pay the bill at the end? Probably my uh child, if he stays here. And of course, we need to do something for the entrepreneurs. How can we? How can those survive? And Admir was already covering that question. We need uh, an attractive uh, business location and labor location. And if if uh, Bosnia Herzegovina wants to be one of those, then definitely a lot of things have to be uh, taken into account. So, without further ado, I simply would like to post one last question to the three of you and just ask you to take 20 minutes sharp uh, to answer. So um, after what we saw happening in the pandemic, can we still count on governments to protect our liberties? If so, why or why not? 
or do we have to defend it ourselves? Okay, <laughs> okay I think uh, 20 seconds, yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yes, we need to count not so much on the government, but on the courts. The problem with the courts is that they are too slow. I forgot to tell you in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, because we have total liberal courts and uh, constitution court, especially of Bosnia and Herzegovina, that's run by foreigners, foreign judges. Uh, we actually had two verdicts uh, stating, for instance, that uh, carrying masks in public is unconstitutional for Canton Sarajevo, and that people uh, uh, that are uh, that have uh, that are in age group over 65 uh, can freely move cannot be discriminated. So, so we had two uh, constitutional judgments in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was really good in, uh, during the times of uh, pandemic. Uh, but the problem is that the government didn't listen, uh, especially to regarding the face masks, and it didn't implement those, those, those things. So I think we should, should not lose faith in a, a justice system. As such, we should protect our natural and any other rights and the government is only problematic there regarding the implementation or figuring out new ways to damage our rights. Thank you very much, Admir. This was, could actually be closing remarks. Farouk, Daniel, would you have, have anything to add, to add to that? I mean, the rule of law yes, is a precondition in Bosnia, for a In Bosnia, we, we don't have one government. We have 13 governments. So um, it depends uh, which government is doing some kind of measures to help you or, or uh, to uh, make you more damage in your everyday life. So I, I'm not in mood, uh, I'm not that optimistic that the government um, that can help you much in future because we are paying, uh, we are paying a lot of taxes to them just to, to uh, use that money to solve our problems, but they are not doing um, their job. If they are doing their job, we should have here vaccines in Bosnia and not uh, going to Serbia or other countries in uh, uh, here in this part of Europe to to try to protect ourselves. It was their only mission to try to to save us, and I think, in my opinion, they failed. Thank you, Farouk. Dania, really, twenty seconds. <laughs> Yes, really, I will be fast. We need, I think, to make a clear distinction between what governments are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to interfere with. And I think the boundaries have been crossed during the pandemic. And in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we had the worst of both of them. So, in terms of what we agree on, what the government should do, I think we as persons, as individuals, as organizations, uh, should put pressure on them to do it efficiently but also uh, to take care of that they do not destroy and interfere with our basic freedom. So I think we need uh, to make a clear rules what uh, free society should look like. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, Farouk, Daniel, Admir. This was, I think, a truly interesting discussion. And as you can see, we could continue forever and ever. So without further ado, I would simply announce our next event, which takes place uh, tomorrow at Blagiovgrad, hosted by the American University in Bulgaria. And our keynote speaker will be Daniel Hannan. Thank you very much. Thanks to Tuzla. Looking forward to seeing you again at the Free Market Roadshow. Good evening.